Dan Gavalik is a human rights lawyer and professor, as well as an expert in U.S. foreign policy in Latin America, most known for exposing U.S.-sponsored human rights abuses in Colombia. He's also the author of the new book, The Plot to Scapegoat Russia. Professor Kavalik just returned from Venezuela as an observer of the country's recent election for the Constituent Assembly. I sat down with him to talk about his experience in Venezuela and Colombia, and the reality behind how they're both presented by the U.S. Empire. So, Dan, you just got back from Venezuela. You were there uh, observing the Constituent Assembly election. I feel like, you know, of course, Venezuela is one of the most crime-ridden countries in the world outside of an active war zone, but you cannot look at Venezuela or the violence and the crime without understanding what's happening in Colombia and, and what the U.S. has done there. Um, Colombia remains the U.S. empire's staunchest ally, of course, the largest aid recipient in the region, receiving at least $10 billion since 2000. It's been called the Israel of Latin America. It's even been said um, from a former U.S. ambassador that the U.S. has more involvement in Colombia than anywhere else in the world, including Afghanistan. Right. Now, people might be really shocked to hear that. You've called it an invisible war for a good reason. Talk about the U.S. military presence in the country today and what this alliance is all about. Right. So the U.S. Ha operates out of about seven military bases in Colombia. And they've been open about the fact that they, they want those bases for power projection throughout Latin America. So they see, they really see Colombia as a beachhead. And their last beachhead in Latin America uh, is a means to control the rest of uh, the hemisphere. The Colombian troops uh, receive uh, more training by numbers at the U.S. School of the Americas than any other country. I think over 10,000 uh, military leaders have been trained in the United States, Colombian military leaders. They then go on to train others, like in Honduras, for example. Um, essentially, it's have gun, will travel. And of course, these are some of the most repressive military leaders in the world. Uh, most notably, these, the Colombian military, which again has been trained by the United States, armed by the United States, was responsible for the false positive scandal, uh, which people may remember. Uh, it's fairly recent. Uh, the high water mark was between 2002 and 2009, where they killed between about four and 6,000 civilians that they knew were civilians, but they dressed them up as guerrillas, would kill them, then put uniforms on them, guns on them in order to push up the numbers to justify more U.S. military aid. So this is, th these are our guys in Colombia. And under what pretenses is the U.S. selling this for? Well, it's shifted, as many of our pretenses have shifted. So at first, it, it began uh, in 1962 with the National Security Doctrine and the idea, at least that we claimed, was to fight communism throughout Latin America, beginning in Colombia. Now, as we know from General William Yarbrough and the things he said at the time, he was the American sent by John F. Kennedy to Colombia to create and begin the National Security Doctrine, which was a doctrine also built around Yarbrough's idea for paramilitary groups. He said we needed these extra paramilitary uh, groups that could give deniability, plausible deniability to the U.S. and its allies in carrying out the war against communists. But he was clear that the commun when he said communists, he meant trade union leaders, peasant leaders, Catholic priests who advocated for the poor, et cetera. And that's who we've been fighting in Colombia. In fact, the FARC didn't even exist till two years after uh, the national security uh, doctrine went into effect. The FARC was formed in 1964. So, but then ever since 1964, we have alternatively claimed we're, we were there to fight guerrillas and we were there to fight drugs. But of course, if you look at the numbers, the drug numbers have actually gone up um, in terms of coca production and cocaine trafficking from Colombia. In fact, when I was in, I was in Colombia in March and I was at the U.S. Embassy and there was a bit of chaos going on and they said that the CIA had come down, the FBI because they said they were gonna to have to answer for the fact that uh, last year was a bumper crop for Colombia. After $10 million we put in there to fight drugs, the drugs were at an all-time high, right? And now, of course, the FARC is gone as a military organization. They've, they've now disarmed. So now what is the justification? I don't think they've given us one yet. <laughs> I think they're working on what the new justification is gonna be, though I do think part of it will be Venezuela and the need to bolster uh, 
the Colombian military against Venezuela, though Venezuela is not a military power or a military threat to Colombia or anyone else, I do think that that is going to be part of the, of the new uh, justification. Go back to the national security doctrine under Kennedy. Um, you say that the paramilitary groups were basically a creation, right, of the U.S. Absolutely. military and the CIA. Right, and we call them that. death squads now, you know, and so the death squads have been used throughout Latin America by the U.S. as a means to prevent social change. And Kennedy, uh, even though he's romanticized a lot by the left, um, one of the things that he was concerned about after the Cuban Revolution and after the Second Vatican Council, by the way, he reacted to that as well. What was that that he reacted to? So the Second Vatican Council under Pope John the Twenty-Third was a real sea change for the Roman Catholic Church. It gave rise to the liberation theology, which was a preferential treatment for the poor. And so for the first time since Constantine had declared the Catholic Church the Church of the Holy Roman Empire, and the church went from being uh, an insurgent church to the church of the conquerors. Uh, the Pope, Pope John the Twenty-Third, wanted to make it again the church of the people and the church of the poor. Well, this was a, an incredible threat to the United States because, uh, particularly in Latin America, where you have a huge percentage of the population Catholic, the idea that priests would be advocating for the poor and for social change was very dangerous, very dangerous idea. So these paramilitary groups were formed, and as they, as they went on, the point of them was to destroy the possibility of social change, including from the Roman Catholic Church. And so one thing they did was to kill priests and to kill bishops, like Archbishop Romero in El Salvador, right? One thing also not discussed uh, in Colombia, which again is the epicenter of these death squads, is that over 80 Catholic priests have been murdered in Colombia since 1984. 80 Catholic priests, if this was in Cuba, we would have vaporized that country by now, right? And these are, according, again, to the Catholic Bishops' Council of Colombia, priests who were killed because they advocated for poor people. And these are the people that we are trying to destroy in Latin America because they represent a threat to the U.S.'s control over the valuable resources in countries like Colombia and Venezuela as well. You've argued that the biggest factor fueling the conflict in Colombia is land, right? The, the ownership of the land, um, unequal land distribution. Break down what the ownership is and how it got this way. Yes, well, and this is fairly typical throughout Latin America. You have a very small percentage of the Colombian population, something like 0.3%, that control about 50% of the land. And the only way they've been able to do this is by forcibly removing people from their land. For example, Afro-Colombians from their ancestral land, indigenous people from their ancestral land, uh, which has created this incredible problem of internal displacement and, and also is pushing about uh, uh, 35 to maybe 65 Indian tribes out of the 100 that exist in Colombia to extinction. This is according to our own State Department. Indigenous tribes are, dis being, are disappearing all the time in Colombia because of this displacement, because they happen to be on the most fertile land or land that has uh, minerals like gold, that sort of thing. And of course, this was all happening during the time of Plan Colombia. Talk about what Plan Colombia did. So Plan Colombia, which Colombians, by the way, call Plan Washington. And this was an idea that the Clinton administration had in the late, about 1999 and early 2000. This is when I started getting involved in Colombia because of the debate over Plan Colombia. And again, they justified a massive influx of aid to the Colombian military, making it the third largest recipient of U.S. military aid in the world, only third to Israel and Egypt, which are always number one and two. And the idea, the, the claim was to, uh, uh, to fight drugs. Okay, so it's switched Columbia. from communism to then drugs, Exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> they needed a new plan. <laughs> right, because the Soviet Union had <laughs> fell. People weren't worried about the Soviet Union right. or Russia anymore, although they're, apparently they are again, but that's another story. <laughs> so it was drugs, right? But it was interesting. I went to a hearing... <clears throat> 
in Washington at that time when they were debating Plan Columbia, and it was a, a hearing that was being sponsored by the Committee on Drugs and Social Policy. And so ostensibly the idea was to talk about Plan Columbia as, as needed to fight drugs in Columbia, right? What else? One of the key people called to testify by Congress for that hearing was the Vice President of Occidental Petroleum, based here in Los Angeles. And he had nothing to say about drugs, presumably knew nothing about them, uh, but was there to talk about the need for the Plan Columbia to defend his pipelines <laughs> in Columbia. And this was at the Committee for Drugs and Social Policy. I think this was a window into what really the U.S. policy towards Colombia and Venezuela as well is about. Mm -hmm. Oil, oil, oil. You mentioned the victims, uh, indigenous people, peasants, the Afro-Colombians, which you have called actually an ethnocide. Right. Uh, we know through our policies. In fact, if you look at some state, I've, I've written some articles, I've, I've looked at some State Department uh, statements that have come out through WikiLeaks, and they've openly talked about the fact that the mining by uh, transnational companies in, in Colombia is pushing literally scores of indigenous groups to the point of extinction. And yet they laugh. Literally in these State Department documents, they mock the idea that the mining would stop, right? They know that what they're doing is literally killing these indigenous groups. That's genocide. I mean, we, we know that this is happening and we won't lift a finger to, to stop it. You bring up a really good point, which is the role that corporations have played in all of this, Dan. Uh, mining corporations, you mentioned, 80% of human rights violations have occurred in mining areas. And of course, we can't forget uh, right, the fruit companies. Chiquita Banana just yes. paid $25 million for its role in also fostering uh, death squads in the country. Talk about corporations and who have been the worst offenders. Yeah, well, Chiquita's a, a, a great case to talk about because we know, because Chiquita pled guilty to paying paramilitary groups $1.7 million over a seven-year period and running them 3,000 Kalashnikov rifles as well. According to a very conservative attorney general under Uribe, a guy named Mario Iguaran, he said that while Chiquita claimed they were paying the paramilitaries for security, in fact, they were paying for the subjugation of the Yoruba region so that they could grow bananas. Because of what Chiquita did, between four and 14,000 people were directly killed by the paramilitaries that they paid and gave guns to. But moreover, according to this Mario Iguaran, uh, their payments and support to the paramilitaries allowed the paramilitaries to take control of vast swaths of Colombia. That the paramilitaries you see today wreaking havoc in that country owe a lot of thanks to the support they got from Chiquita. As you noted, for part of the time they uh, were paying the paramilitaries, the paramilitaries were a designated terrorist group by the United States. No one went to jail and the eight officials who participated in the payment scheme, their names were kept secret from the Colombian government who had some interest in extraditing them for their crimes, right? We found out from uh, Salvatore Mancuso, who was one of the top paramilitary leaders, that it was not just Chiquita paying the paramilitaries, but also Dole and Del Monte. That in fact, Dole was the tax collector for the paramilitaries. He, they would go around all the companies, collect the taxes, give them to the paramilitary groups. And yet, Dole and Del Monte have never been uh, prosecuted. And there's a number of companies also uh, that have uh, made payments uh, to the paramilitaries. According to Salvatore Mancuso and his de department, the Cesar department, he said every company there was paying them. Um, and in order to keep Mancuso quiet, he will probably be walking the streets of the U.S. Uh, very soon. He was taken out of Colombia. He was going to be tried for his crimes, which amounted to killing at least a thousand people in Colombia. Uh, the CIA helped take him and about 39 other paramilitary leaders out of Colombia so that they would not be tried for those crimes because they were worried he'd start talking about the companies that were p helping him carry out his operation. This is, this is very crazy. I want you to elaborate more on this, that there are how many people that are... 40 paramilitary leaders. By the way, this is according to the New York Times. <laughs> incredible. Who did an incredible expose on this. 
in order to get light sentences, they were supposed to fully confess to all their crimes. Uribe started to get nervous because they started to confess to their connections with the Congress there, with he himself, with corporations, and he said, hey, I can't let this happen. This is nuts. So the U.S. helped him out. On one, in one evening, they took about 40 of these guys out of Colombian prisons, took them to the U.S., have tried them here only for drug-related offenses, cut plea deals with all of them, giving them a, a short sentence, even though, again, some have murdered uh, thousands of people. According to the New York Times, one of the paramilitary leaders was known as the Drill because of his penchant for molesting girls as young as nine years old. He was also one of the paramilitary leaders brought to the United States. And uh, he will most likely get out very soon um, from prison. And he is asking to stay in the United States mm, nice. and probably will be allowed to do that. In June of this year, there was a huge development, as you just mentioned, FARC disarmed. After 52 years of fighting this left-wing guerrilla group in the country, the largest guerrilla group, if I'm not mistaken, laid down their arms. What's the significance of the de-escalation and, and um, did it seize the violence? So the FARC had its uh, uh, origins in the peasants. They actually, initially, before they were the FARC, they were essentially these peasant, uh, independent peasant co-ops in Colombia. Uh, in fact, uh, they were viewed by the Colombian and U.S. government as a threat, not because of violence, but because they were seen as these kind of independent states within Colombia. In truth, Colombia has not even had a central government for the whole country till very, very recently. So they filled this vacuum and, and they basically had their own kind of co communistic with a small C society, uh, which was a threat not because of violence, but because it represented a different alternative economy to, to the prevailing capitalist economy. And so, as is often happens to these burgeoning kind of socialist uh, groups and co-ops, uh, the real beginning of the Civil War and of the FARC was a combined us Colombia assault on these independent republics where these peasant communities were bombed uh, uh, by, with napalm uh, by the United States. And that took place in 1964 and that led to the creation of the FARC. The significance is, as you say, that it ended the longest running uh, civil war in, in the world. And one has to give credit to the FARC for being willing to take that chance, because they knew it was a chance, because we know in the 1980s, they also disarmed. And people might recall they were allowed to form a political party called the UP, and three to 5,000 of their leaders were murdered. That's what sent them back into the mountains. So they knew that this was a huge risk to do this, but they did it in the name of peace. Uh, the problem is, is, is you asked about, about uh, the violence. Now, the violence has actually started to increase since the signing of the peace process. Now, people may say, well, wow, that's kind of weird. What we see is that these right-wing paramilitary groups that have their origin in, in General Yarborough's plan back in 1962 uh, still exist, despite the U.S. and Colombian denial. They deny they exist. I, I've sat with the ambassador from the United States with people that have been victimized by the paramilitaries. And he has said, looked us in the eye and said, the paramilitaries don't exist anymore, okay? Which is all according to plan. That works out great. So these paramilitaries who don't exist anymore uh, now control 74 of about 250 municipalities. They essentially have moved in now that the FARC has retreated. The paramilitaries have moved in. They're taking over land. They're taking over towns. And in the process, they're killing peace activists, they're killing trade union leaders, they're killing human rights leaders, indigenous leaders, leaders, Afro-Colombians. I think it's going to be very difficult because the paramilitaries are wiping out their base, as they have always done, right? The paramilitaries have more targeted civilians that are the potential support for them. It's not so much you attack the guerrillas, but you attack their potential support. And that's why you have 7 million people internally displaced in Colombia. Largest internally displaced population on Earth, more than even in Syria. Um, 
And these are people, the poor, peasants, indigenous. And so they are able to act with total impunity throughout Colombia. And again, there is an irony when every time something bad happens in Venezuela, there's a new story about it, right? Um, but you have these horrible crimes being committed in Colombia. I'll just give you one example. There's a town called Buenaventura, which was supposed to be the model city for the Colombia Free Trade Agreement. It's a port town. And even before the Free Trade Agreement was finally passed under Obama in 2012, they started to modernize their ports there. They spent a lot of money on it. Well, the paramilitaries were very interested in having control of those ports, you know, for money and also drug trafficking. And so they have waged a terror campaign in Buenaventura, which has continued to this day. They have killed hundreds of people. They forcibly disappeared hundreds of people a la Argentina. And they have these chop houses. And I'm not making this up. You can read Human Rights Watch. You can read Amnesty International. They'll tell you they have these chop houses where they chop people up alive with uh, uh, machetes uh, or chainsaws in order to terrorize the population. This is happening in Buenaventura as we speak. And yet, when was the last time you heard about Buenaventura in the news? It's supposed to be Number. the model city. Right, it's now the poster child for the Columbia Free Trade Agreement. And by the way, I mentioned forced disappearances. In Colombia, there have been 92,000 people disappeared, and that's of, two, of 2015, and that's according to the Red Cross, International uh, Red Cross. 92,000, that's three times more than Argentina, which is the forced disappearance capital of the world. Dan, when we talk about victims here, we forgot to mention trade unionists. Right. All right, this is the most dangerous country in the world for trade unionists. As, as a country, you know, speaking as an American, the history of the labor struggles here have been completely censored from right. U.S. history. What is going on there? I mean, I mean, why are unionists, especially half our teachers, right. half of the unionists killed our teachers, explain this whole scenario? Well, so all social leaders in Colombia are targets of the paramilitaries. But trade unionists uh, are certainly a special case because uh, they represent a challenge to the economic system in Colombia, right? And, and to, to corporate interests because they're trying to get their piece of the pie, right? And so since 1986, when the COOT was formed, the COOT is the largest uh, trade union confederation in Colombia. It's like the AFL-CIO of Colombia. Over 4,000 trade union leaders have been murdered. And year after year after year, Colombia, as you say, is the most dangerous country in the world to be a trade unionist because more trade unionists are killed there each and every year than any other country in the world, which is staggering, you know, given the fact they only have 50 million people. And so uh, the onslaught's been incredible, and it's been very effective at destroying the trade union movement there to the point where less than 1% of workers in Colombia are covered by labor contracts. The Paris state, and it is, it's a paramilitary, terry, paramilitary state in Colombia, um, has very deep roots because they've had roots going back to the 1960s. And it is part and parcel of that government and of that society and of the military that we're funding. And the U.S. knows this. And again, uh, there's certainly sectors of the U.S. government that's happy that that's happening because the paramilitaries are looking out for corporate interest. And as long as that happens, they will continue to dominate both the economy and, and, and uh, the politics and Colombian society. And astoundingly, you have corporate media outlets actually, you know, of course, not only are they censoring the reality in Colombia, but then they say Venezuela, right, is the biggest humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, trade unionists are in more danger in Venezuela than anywhere else, right? Some right. NPR report actually came out with that. I mean, talk about the, the contradictions, right? The dichotomy of coverage when it comes to humanitarian issues and, and violence on these neighboring countries. Yeah, well, it, it, I think it is very important to point that out because you have these two countries that are, are side by side. Colombia, which as you know, is the, is the top ally of the US in the region. Then you have Venezuela, which has since 1999 been trying to go its own independent course, right? In regards to Colombia, which again, on numerous factors, has the worst, I believe, the worst human rights in the hemisphere, when you look at the number of disappearances, greater than any country, greatest internally displaced population, greatest number of human rights leaders killed, greatest number of trade unionists killed, greatest number of priests killed, you can go down the line. 
has the worst human rights by many measures. In fact, has thousands of political prisoners, many more than even the right-wing uh, Cubans claim Cuba has. And yet, there's almost a total media blackout on Colombia when it comes to any of these things. Uh, or anything at all, for that matter. I, I, I don't remember the last time. I do happen to listen to NPR. I don't remember the last time I heard anything about Colombia. Meanwhile, next door Venezuela, anything bad that happens is at the top of the news cycle, right? As you say, you know, they have struggled economically. There are shortages in Venezuela, though there's various reasons for those shortages that we can talk about, and you've done some great work on that issue. But there is not this mass murder of human rights leaders in Venezuela. To the extent trade unionists are being killed, they're generally Chavista trade union leaders that are being killed by opposition forces, right? They're not being killed by government forces. And yet this is all obscured in, in, in the uh, mass media in this country. And of course, you can't look at the crime and chaos in Venezuela without understanding how Colombia fuels it, Dan. Right. Well, there's two ways in which this happens. First of all, most people don't know the fact that uh, six million Colombian refugees live in Venezuela. The Venezuelans have been very generous in allowing them to move to Venezuela. There's only, Out of how many? Yeah. There's only 31 Venezuelans. 31 million. That's yeah. a lot of people. You can imagine what that does to the economy, right? Um, so that's one way in which the conflict in Colombia has directly affected Venezuela. But the other way it's affected it is that paramilitaries in Colombia have, uh, have gone into Venezuela, have killed people in Venezuela, have actually targeted Chavistas in Venezuela, all by design, and of course, very much with a wink and a nod, both from the Colombian and U.S. governments, who are happy to sow chaos in this country, in, in Venezuela. And so they've also inherited that par paramilitary problem as well. And it's so anger provoking for me, you know, when all of the problems Venezuela is suffering, when it's all laid at the hands or laid at the feet of, of the Maduro government, when in fact you have these externalities, like the ones I mentioned, which really impact that society. Um, it's just incredibly unfair. The other thing that, ha that, that happened is that uh, Venezuela has tried very hard to provide food for people, so they've subsidized their food for poor people, right? And what happened is um, people would take the subsidized food, go to Colombia, and sell it at a market rate for a profit, right? And so it made it almost impossible to keep feeding people. You're trying to subsidize your own you know, people, their own food, and then the food's just going right out the door. Or, of course, you're having also members of the opposition who are hoarding it or even burning it in some, uh, in some cases. Just yesterday, there was a, another attack uh, right by the right-wing paramilitary forces in um, Venezuela posing as rebellious soldiers. It turned out where only one of them was actually a soldier. The other ones were dressed as soldiers. In what ways do you think Colombia is fronting or fueling or funding or training the opposition in Venezuela? Yeah, well, certainly, first of all, we have... Uh, I've mentioned Alvaro Uribe, who deserves a lot of mentioning. He was the president of Colombia uh, between 2002 and I believe 2010. He's currently a senator in Colombia and he still has a lot of political power and influence in that country and is the darling of many people in the US. Uh, George W. Bush said he was his closest friend in the hemisphere. Of course, he got a presidential medal of freedom, right? That's right. That's exactly right from George W. Bush. He got a nice reception at the White House from Obama. He got to teach at Georgetown for a while. He is the intellectual author, or one of the intellectual authors of the paramilitaries in Colombia. And he's also very open about the fact that he wants to see regime change in Venezuela. And it is very clear that the right-wing paramilitaries are being used consciously as a mechanism for that regime change in Venezuela. Uh, in a number of ways, you mentioned this attack over the weekend. There have been attempted assassinations of Chavez by paramilitary forces. And again, when I look at that fact, it's hard for me not to think about uh, the head of the CIA, Mike Pompeo, who said about two weeks ago 
that he would like to see regime change in Venezuela and that he's working with both Colombia and Mexico to bring that about. So how much are these paramilitaries figuring in to that plan? I have to believe quite a lot. Mm -hmm. You just got back from Caracas. Uh, you were observing the recent Constituent Assembly election. Respond to some of the allegations of fraud here, right. of course, in the mainstream media, and also from what you witnessed, was the process more democratic or dictatorial, like the corporate media is saying? Right. So first of all, I went to the Department of Vargas, uh, which is about an hour outside uh, the city uh, center of Caracas. And, uh, and the polling places that I witnessed were inspiring. The voting was very orderly, and they use uh, very good technology uh, that, that Jimmy Carter said uh, amounted to uh, the best election process in the world. It's the same technology and same process he talked about when he made that statement. It's the same branch of government that ran these elections, the CNE, um, which is a very trustworthy institution, which is independent from the Maduro government, which uh, has gotten a lot of accolades for their election processes. So I believe I have to, my, my starting point has to, to say that I have a lot of trust in the electoral system there. And I was an observer, by the way, in 2013 as well. Not only on election day, but also I was part of, I got to uh, witness the auditing process later. Which brings me to the next point. If, if people have concerns about how things happen that day, uh, they can have an audit. And I'm sure there will be an audit. And it can be audited because there's paper receipts, the records are kept. Uh, there can be an audit in the way you can't have in the United States. So I have a unlike, lot of... Unlike the faux vote referendum from the opposition weeks prior, they didn't have an audit. You could vote several times as, as people from Telesor proved with their investigation. You know, and they so, burned and, and all the ballots. They burned all the ballots. <laughs> there was no question from the media about how many... You know, that, that number was taken just... Right. That's right. That was taken uh, at its face, and right now everyone's questioning, you know, whether these numbers are right. Again, in the fullness of time, I'm sure that certain they, they will have an audit. In any case, I think what we know is that a very strong turnout happened in Venezuela, much larger than, than the U.S. government thought would happen, much larger than the opposition thought would happen, maybe even more than, frankly, uh, the Chavistas thought would happen. They seemed a bit surprised themselves, happily surprised. Which to me shows that there is still a very strong core of support for the revolutionary process there. And when I say revolutionary, I guess I need to be clear. I mean the Chavez-Maduro revolution, not the opposition revolution, which is really a counter-revolution. I think that's a word that isn't even used much anymore. At least when I was growing up, uh, with like the Nicaraguan Contras, you know, they were called Contras, counter-revolutionaries. At least they had the decency to call them what they were, right? <laughs> uh, so I think there is still a lot of support for the revolutionary process. I think that they deserve the support of progressives in this country. And I think we need to support that process. And what I can guarantee, for sure, 100%, is if that opposition gets into power and they are able to oust Maduro, you will see some type of Pinochet-like regime in Venezuela. I mean, uh, if we go back to Chile in the 1970s, a Yen as President Salvador Allende was ousted by Pinochet after about th being in power for three years. And you saw the thousands of people killed, thousands of people tortured by Pinochet. Here you have a revolutionary process that has been very successful since 1999, right? That's about 18 years or so. Can you imagine the bloodletting that will have to happen to overturn that process. It will, be, it will be incredible. And I think people need to think about that when they think about their relationship with the Venezuelan process. By the way, I'll note in 2002, when the same people who are running the opposition now were successful in the coup against Chavez, they just threw out the Constitution. They didn't bother having the nicety of a constituent assembly, uh, which people have to remember when they hear them you know, complain about democracy and that sort of thing. I don't know what the Constituent Assembly is going to come up with, but again, given the nature of the people on it, I have some confidence that it'll be something good. All of this talk about democracy really doesn't have any leg to stand on, Dan, when you look at how democratic 
the system really is, and it's just they don't want democracy. I mean, we're talking about the same opposition that has been fighting for so-called democracy that has only tried to take control through undemocratic means since Chavez took power. Right. Correct? I mean, That's look. exactly right. Again, an opposition that supported a military coup d'etat against President Chavez, the elected leader of the country. And when they had the chance to lead for about the three days they did until the poor came down from the hills and ousted them, they got rid of the Constitution. They disbanded the Supreme Court. They disbanded the National Assembly. They showed their hand pretty quickly that these are not Democrats. These are people that want to have power back so that the rich will be able to dominate in that society again. But also, I do believe with Perenni that revolutions have the right to defend themselves. They don't have to lay down and just capitulate, which is really what's being demanded of Maduro. Mm -hmm. People are saying he should step down. He was duly elected. It's a struggle, you know, and it's a struggle for a little country like Venezuela in a sea of opposition, including its next door neighbor, Colombia, and including, of course, the Colossus to the North, the United States. It's hard to survive. And I give it credit for surviving as long as it has. I think it's a process that, that des deserves defending, again, especially when you look at the history of the U.S. towards Latin America, which was, has been a history of coup d'etats, of support for right-wing dictatorships, support for death squads. It's not a pretty picture, you know. Um, and, and I think we need to defend Latin America from, from the United States, from our own country. Americans may not realize that Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world, uh, surpassing Saudi Arabia. Um, with ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson at the helm of the U.S. empire, and of course this xenophobic fervor in the country right now, this uber-capitalist administration, what do you think this means not only for Venezuela but just the region? Well, again, I think that you really have a, a pretty monumental showdown between the U.S. on the one hand, as you said, being led by big oil um, against a very grassroots process, not just in Venezuela, but throughout Latin America. And if Venezuela goes backwards, you know, towards the time of the oligarchs and towards the time that really it was an appendage of the United States, um, I think something great will be lost. And there's no question that the U.S. has designs on Venezuela's oil. And it's coal tan. You just see that now it looks like they have the largest coal tan reserves in the world, which is used for cell phones, for example. So uh, the stakes are, are pretty high. You know, I mean, so here is a country that if it can use its resources for its people, will do good things for them. You know, and the U.S. is dead set against that happening. There's no question about that.